Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm very pleased to introduce Matthias Bloom from uh, TTI, Toyota Techno Technological Institute at Chicago. And uh, Matthias has been working uh, on the area of program language and compilers for many years, more than um, 10 years. <laughs> and uh, today he's going to talk about records, sums, cases, and exceptions. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me well? OK. so. Uh, uh, this is, I should say, this is joint work with my colleague Umut Akar at uh, TTI and with my student uh, Wansok Cha. I should probably stay here. Um, since the talk is, uh, the, the title of the talk, are you here? Um, already contains the word polymorphism in a very prominent way, I will start with a quick uh, review of uh, what polymorphism is and in particular what row polymorphism is. Um, and then we will look at um, one sort of use case of this uh, in, the, in the context uh, of sums and cases. Um, and then I will, uh, in, the, in part three, I will talk about tracking exceptions, which is uh, new work, which uh, is currently under review. Um, then I will say something about the, uh, the soundness of this uh, type system that we developed. And at the, at the end of the talk, I will um, give three sort of one-page ads for some other work that I've uh, recently been involved in. OK, so polymorphism, uh, very quickly, means that we have functions that, or in general, program fragments that can work on data of many types. Uh, so this shouldn't be too surprising, um, but here we, we focus on parametric polymorphism, uh, the way you find it in many functional programming languages, but recently you also find it in languages like uh, C Sharp or Java. And um, one uh, um, key aspect of parametric polymorphism is that the functionality of a function does not depend on how, the, how it is instantiated, at which type it is instantiated. Um, parametric polymorphism has a very nice connection to logic uh, in, uh, via the curry howard isomorphism. Um, there's a connection between um, polymorphic types and, and universal quantification. And uh, we can capture this very nicely in higher order lambda calculi. And uh, last but not least, uh, it is uh, the key to hindley milner type inference. So just a quick example um, that you have seen many times, I'm sure. Uh, the map function uh, takes a function parameter f and a list parameter l, and it will uh, map f over the elements of l and produce an output list, which um, captures the results of these function applications. Um, the code as written without type constraints makes no assumptions about what the argument and the result type of f are. And we can capture this in a polymorphic type that um, in its full glory looks like the following. Give me a function from any argument type alpha to any ar result type beta, and I'll give you back a function from, any, uh, from a list type where the elements are of type alpha, and I'll give you big, back a list where the element types are beta. And notice the universal quantifier on alpha and beta. These are type variables. With, um, Rule polymorphism or record polymorphism, we uh, have a slightly different scenario. Here, um, suppose we, have, we look at a function like this uh, successor A um, that takes a record argument. It, pro it projects out one of the fields of the, of the record, I'm sorry, R, um, and we, we project out field A from R and add one. So what do we know about this function? Um, we know that it takes some argument, here represented by alpha, and produces an int. But there's a constraint on this, um, on this alpha 
namely that it has to be instantiated to a record which has to have a field A of type int, but it can have other fields as well. So this is um, uh, the, uh, the type that uh, in Ohori's SML sharp would be given to this function. And uh, so this constraint on the type variable is called a kind. It's kind is sort of the type of a type variable. And uh, the nice thing about this approach is that it actually leads to an efficient compilation strategy. Um, if you want to implement this function, you have to somehow implement a projection of a field A. Even though you don't really know where it is in, the, in, in a given um, memory region representing this record, because you don't know what the other fields are. So therefore, you have to pass uh, a witness parameter, an index, uh, that tells you where in memory, where, where the, what is the offset of field A in that memory region. And uh, now, how do we know when and where to add these witness parameters? Well, we just look at the type. And we see the type has a kind constraint on a, on a universally quantified type variable. And the kind constraint mentions a particular label. And each such label that we mentioned there corresponds to one of these extra arguments that the compiler in introduces. And this works for other functions the same way. Suppose we project out two different fields, then we need two separate parameters, and indeed they correspond exactly to the labels in the universal type, in the kinds of the on, the on the universally quantified type variable. Now, there's a different way of writing this type, and that's uh, championed uh, originally by Remy's uh, row polymorphism, uh, which is slightly more general. But um, for this particular example, we have um, uh, we have the following. We say that the function takes a record with a field A of type int to int, but the record can have other fields represented by this so-called row type variable alpha. So the alpha here is not an ordinary type variable, but it represents a whole row of other fields. And the only constraint on that row is that it must not already contain a field A, otherwise we would have two fields A in this record. So the, uh, the kind on the row type variables uh, are, represent absentee information. And I don't need to go through this in detail, but the same compilation strategy can be applied um, as before in the, uh, in the Ohori approach. Now the nice thing about row polymorphism is that it's actually more general. It can express more things. We can uh, extend a record. We can take a record in and produce a record that has the same fields as the input record, but also an additional field. And we can capture the type of this function by saying we have an argument type, which is a record of some fields alpha, and we produce a, an output record which has the same fields alpha plus a. And again, alpha must not already contain a. And in the ICFP 06 paper, we have uh, shown uh, how to generalize Ohori's uh, implementation strategy for this. So row polymorphism is nice because it can be used to um, uh, represent, for example, slices of records. We can implement functional record update on as a as syntactic sugar in some sense on top of it. And we, there are several interesting programming patterns involving row polymorphism uh, uh, that um, that are quite useful in practice, such as uh, partial application and also default arguments for function parameters. Okay, so this was my, my short crash course on, uh, on uh, row polymorphism. So now let's look at a particular use case. And what I'm looking at here is the so-called expression problem. This is uh, a, a word or a phrase coined by Phil Wardler in 98. And he observed that in functional languages, which typically uh, uh, define data types, it is easy to add new functions that operate on, on existing data types, but it is hard to add new cases. That's because when we add a new case to a data type, we will have to patch all the functions that uh, operate on that type. In object-oriented languages that are class-based, so the, the opposite of this is true. We can easily add new cases by subclassing from the, from the common base class, 
But it's difficult to add new functions because now we would have to go through the hierarchy of uh, the class hierarchy and add new methods everywhere. So this problem is, um, is of course, not, uh, not the first time that someone looks at this. And in the object uh, community, um, there's been a lot of work on this. Um, here, I'm approaching this sort of from the function, from the data type point of view. The running example uh, shall be this extremely simple expression type, which just has, has integer constants and a plus operation on expressions. And we have a little evaluator here. And we can define an, another function, which, for example, this blue function down here, which, uh, say, counts the number of operators in an expression. And this will not interfere with the existing code at all. But if we add a new case to the data type, now we have to go back and patch our eval function. And we cannot reuse the existing code. In our language ML poly R, which is our little language that has these row, poly uh, row polymorphic constructs, um, here's the original non-extensible interpreter. Notice that we don't actually declare any data types. Data types are some types and are inferred by the compiler. So the first thing we do is we make the syntax look more clumsy. And why do we do this? Because we will take the, the clauses in a case expression and call them a first class entity. The clauses in a case expression um, evaluate to a value of type cases um, and we can separate that piece of the code out. So notice that now we have a, a free variable in this code called eval, which we should close over. And the original code we can now patch up by calling that, by instantiating this abstraction down here, passing in the eval function. So nothing has changed so far. It's the same code, it's just written in a slightly different way. But what's going on? How should we explain this? Before I go on, I should show you a little bit about the types. With records, we have the situation that we have record types which can have row variables in them. So records are row rows enclosed by curly braces. Now, what are sums? Well, we have expressions that inject payload, like here an integer 1 or a Boolean true, into a sum type. The sum type itself is written as a row enclosed in just some other kind of bracket. In this case, we're using angle brackets. And again, we can have row type variables in those sum types. So in a general case, a sum type is a row enclosed in angle brackets. And cases are essentially a special purpose function type from sums to some result. So we, uh, a value of type cases which uh, can handle an A and a B variant would have this type. And notice we use this funny hook arrow to indicate that we're talking about cases, not about a general purpose function. The first expression just evaluates to a value of type cases. The second expression has a free variable c, and which is itself of type cases. And it produces new cases which extend c, which handle all the variants that are handled by c, plus also a and b. So the same thing that we did with records before, now we do with cases here. So how does it help us? We can now write our evaluator as before, as I, show, uh, as I showed you before. We can write new functions which don't disturb the existing functions at all, as before. But we can now also write an interpreter that, has an, that handles an additional case, but refers to the existing code. So here is, are the cases that handle minus as well as plus and constants by reference back up here. And voila, I have, a, I have an interpreter for that language. And notice I didn't have to change any of the existing code. Now you might say, well, uh, hold on. Um, we can, of course, do the same thing with the other function as well. But you might say, well, this is not terribly exciting. Languages that have plus, minus, and constants are not terribly useful, obviously. Um, does this work for a more general language, for example, one that has actual variables and binding structure? And indeed it does. And here's how it works. So here's the, here's the non-extensible interpreter that we might write. 
So we handle constants plus variables and let. And the evaluator now takes, in addition to the expression being evaluated, it also takes an environment. And this is the, the usual code uh, for constants. We return the value directly. For plus, we evaluate the subterms for variable and, and add them. Uh, for variables, we look up the variable in the environment. And for let, we evaluate the definition expression, bind its value to the variable in the environment, and in the, exist, in the, in the resulting environment, we evaluate the body. And we assume that there's some kind of binding operation for variables and environments. Now, how do we write this in an extensible way? And the idea is the following. We write each case separately as an extension over other cases. So the constant, the case that handles constants is written parameterized over the other cases here represented by this variable d. And notice that the constant case doesn't actually need to know the, the evaluator or the environment. It only needs the constant itself. The plus case also abstracts over all the other cases represented by d, but it takes its parameterized over an evaluator for subterms. And notice that this evaluator doesn't know anything about environments. It's just an evaluator for subterms. The case for variables is, uh, is parameterized over the environment. It doesn't need an evaluator because there are no subterms to evaluate. And the let case is parameterized over the evaluator and the environment. And notice that this eval is different from the eval up here because it is the eval that itself is parameterized over the environment. So this is the same case we had before. So in some sense, we took the code from the previous slide apart, and we only, gave, uh, we only provided the parameters that each snippet really needs. And then we can plug it back together and say, OK, our, our full evaluator matches the input expression with cases constructed by this long string, which is essentially just plugging everything together. The constant, the plus case, which is parameterized over the evaluator for subterm, which is our evaluator instantiated at the current environment. The variable case, parameterized over the current environment. And the let case, parameterized over the full evaluator and the environment. And we start things off by some dummy value that represents no cases at all. I don't quite understand how this is going to work if you um, plug in the current environment into the plus case, and if the plus appears underneath of that binding, how is it going to get the new norm? Well, because at, at that time you, you go around the loop and you get a new environment. But you're passing in eval is eval is recursive, right? Yes. And it gets it gets invoked with that environment, and then the case analysis takes place again. So this is sort of a CPS conversion almost. Yeah, you're, everything has a continuation, sort of like every function has sort of a, it does its thing, and then it well maybe even that CPS is not no, the right thing. You can think of these each little function as a slice uh, of a larger case expression. And uh, by functional composition, you can plug them all together into one large case again. Can you go back one slide? I'm sorry, to the previous one where you showed the coloring. Yeah, so, I mean, strictly speaking, you, you do have to change something, right? Because you, where you previously were calling a vowel, when you extend with minus, you have to call about minus, right? So you do have to change the code. To, or am no, I wrong about that? No, the, the existing, I'm, I'm, this is, you can think of this as sitting in a library. I'm not touching this code, but I'm referring to it. But I have to retie the recursive knot at the end of the day. So wow. th this little bit of boilerplate code I will have to write. That's indeed true, yes. Uh, okay. But that's new code. That's not patching existing code. That's new oh, code. Oh, so you don't. So let me let me just make sure I see. So the control flow is going to go from eval to eval C, and I'm just seeing how do I get from eval to eval minus? 
Uh, well, I have this new function of val minus here. This is a, this now is I a, have to call eval minus instead yes. of eval. Okay. Right, right, right. I mean, I could have called this eval. Then it would shadow the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So here, it's also possible to make a higher order version of eval, right? Where you sort of give it the the cases that haven't been implemented yet, and initially it, it's just default. It just it just throws the exception not implemented, and then as you extend that, you could just right. But this is in some sense. I mean, what we're not doing it with extension uh, with exceptions. This d parameter is exactly this sort of the the rest of the world, the other cases that we don't know about. Yeah, I'm just thinking if. If you if you wanted to make it so you didn't have to change eval, could you make things higher order so that you, you wouldn't have to replace eval by eval minus, but simply plug in a new? Well, you're going to have to change something. Um, right, you, take, some you take that one to the limit. You take eval yeah. that says, okay, here's a language yeah, evaluator yeah, yeah, yeah. and here's an expression <laughs> and prior right. to each other. Okay. So uh, just to wrap this up quickly. Um, it was nice to go back to the previous slide because I can actually recover the previous interpreter for just the language with constants and plus from the same pieces. Because plus didn't know about it, uh, anything about environments and constants didn't either. Okay, so uh, all I've tried to show you is that it seems to be a very nice um, set of programming features to play around with. So the, the expression problem, solving expression problem, was not really our explicit goal. It was just something that, that was um, uh, nice to find uh, at the end of the day. But what we wanted was conceptual simplicity. So we have the same kind of row types that we already had for records. We just applied them in a different way. We still have a language that has complete type inference in prin based on principal types. And it can also be implemented using the same index passing uh, technology uh, that um, Ohori, among others, pioneered. So, solving the expression problem has sort of two aspects, right? One is not touching existing code, which you can do. But the other one, which I think is more important, is also how much existing, or how much do you have to change? It is for one change, like adding a function or adding a case, how many things do you have to touch? I mean, how many extra pieces of code do you have to write? It seems to me that in, in this case, every, every place I have a, a case statement, a case analysis, you will have to do something, right? That's if I have 500 case analysis in my code, you should have to change 500 places, right? So you don't really address that problem. And, and in some sense, yeah, you have it factor, but for me, I don't see why this is any easier than just letting the compiler tell me, oh, here, 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 here you're missing a case, and just going and adding that case directly into the existing code. Well, if you have access to that code, that's fine. Uh, it's yeah, more that's true. I mean, if, if the code that was written that you can't touch didn't already premeditate this possible extension, you're stuck as well, right? Oh uh, yes, yeah. So th and that's why I put this in parentheses. This is um, this is not the uh, the last word on the expression problem, and it wasn't even the goal, but it was sort of just a neat thing that you can do with this kind of type system. So now let's move on to exceptions, and those are maybe a little bit more exciting, actually. Um, so what we have here is uh, we add to our language what we find in other uh, ML-like languages. We have an expression for raising exceptions. And notice that the, 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 exception type are, the exception types are just sums. They're not special at all. And um, we have handle expressions which can run in a computation under a handler, meaning that if f raises exception a, this exception will abandon the current flow of control, jump back to this handler, and directly bail out. So what we want to do is we have here two goals. We want to have no uncaught exceptions. And the second goal is we don't want to have false positives in the sense that when we write reasonable code that doesn't have uncaught exceptions at runtime, we don't want the compiler to, be, to tell us that there might be. So um, let me go through a quick sequence of examples to show you that this might not be completely trivial. Um, 
Um, so the baseline functionality is, of course, if we have a manifest race with a manifest handler, we definitely want to, ha to get that right. We don't want to complain about this. Right? This seems to be uh, fine. But if we move the site where the exception is handled away from where this, uh, where the exception is raised away from where it is handled, for example, into a separate function, now we already have to track somehow in the type of that function that the exception has to, can, might be raised. It gets even more complicated if we have higher order functions, such as map, because here the function that raises the exception is a parameter to the function we're calling. So we need to track the information about exceptions in G through the call of map uh, so that we still see that this code is fine. And worse, high order functions can be queried and this function uh, map will not raise any exceptions when, it's, when you only apply it partially to a function. When you call map of G giving you back a function that takes a list, that call here will not, never ta raise an exception. So we have to distinguish between the stages at which exceptions might be raised. And uh, things get potentially even more complicated if we uh, treat exception values as first class values as we do. So we might have data structures such as a list which carry an exception around which then gets raised. But here, for example, here we call this function f with a list which has manifestly a and b in the exceptions a and b. And uh, so it suffices to have handlers for these two exceptions. And finally, our control flow and data flow can get very complicated. Uh, just as a straw man example for this, uh, suppose we have a function that um, raises an exception whose payload is another exception. And another, the second function calls the first function, handles the first exception, and raises its payload as an exception. We should be OK to call the second function with a handler just for b. So we wanted to design a type system which, uh, with apologies to Robin Milner, uh, has this property. Well-typed programs do not have uncaught exceptions. How do we do this? Well, we start uh, by looking at typing judgments. And uh, I apologize, but there, there are a few typing judgments in the talk. So uh, normally, we, we have a typing judgment of this form. E has type tau. Uh, where gamma is the typing environment which maps free variables to types and delta is the kinding environment which maps free type variables to their kinds. So the type variables can be in tau or in gamma. And uh, the type of tau, uh, the, the type tau describes the result of E, of course, but you can also think of it as describing which type the context of E expects. Now, when we want to track exceptions, we add another ingredient to the typing judgment, which is the exception type. And the exception type is a row type indicated by, this, by the choice of the Greek letter here. Um, and the exception type, in a similar way, describes which exceptions the context expects, or the, which exceptions the context is prepared to handle. Of course, we need to change a few other things. For example, the type language itself, we have to annotate function errors with the exceptions that might be raised when the function is called. It's basically describing which exception context we need when we call this function. And the same thing has to be done for the cases. Now, one word about function types and, and annotation on functions. A function that does not raise any exception, we might think that we should type it this way. It's tau1 arrow type 2 with an empty row up here. And that indeed uh, would capture that the, fu that the function doesn't raise exceptions, but it's not quite as general as we like it. Uh, what we do instead, we give it a polymorphic type. We say, for all alpha, with, without any restrictions on this row type alpha, uh, it's tau1 arrow tau2 with, annotated with alpha. And this, of course, captures the same idea because it can be this type is an instance of that type. Um, but the nice thing about the second one is that now we can use a function of this type in any context, no matter what exceptions it handles. 
So we get subsumption just by instantiation of polymorphic types. We don't need subtypes. We don't need subtyping in this type system. And that's, of course, the, uh, a key if we want to do type inference. Um, here's the typing rule for arrays. Uh, race raises uh, its payload as an exception. The, the payload is a, is a sum, so the exception type of the race expression is uh, described by the same row that the sum type of its argument is described by. And uh, perhaps most importantly, the handle expression. Suppose we want to type check this kind of expression handle. Uh, we, we are handling an expression, uh, an exception L with label L in E1. If the current exception context is described by a row, then E1 is type checked in an expression co uh, exception context which handles everything that the row handles, but also the exception described by L. So there's a row extension going on at this point. And that so should sound familiar to what we had before where we also extended row types. Okay, now uh, part four, which talks about um, how this all fits together. How do we get soundness for this type system? How can we make this claim that we don't have uncaught exceptions? Um, and this will actually also lead into a discussion, a brief discussion of how to implement this. So the claim that we don't have uh, uncaught exceptions is uh, well, it's motivated, maybe not justified, but motivated by this typing rule for whole programs. A whole program has type int in, in some initial environment, and its exception type is the empty row. And that will force us that, uh, will force, um, will force us to write code in such a way that it doesn't have uncode exceptions. But this is true only uh, if our type system is actually sound. And otherwise, we don't really know that. And when I speak of soundness, of course, I cannot do this without telling you uh, what the dynamic semantics of the language are. Because soundness is inherently a statement about the relation between the static and the dynamic semantics. So we need a, the proof of, uh, proof of soundness, which relates these two pieces. Okay, so dynamic semantics. Dynamic semantics describes what happens at one time. And uh, there are many approaches, but two uh, prominent ones, I think, are uh, we define an operational semantics directly for the source language. And then we use some standard techniques to show soundness for the type system. And the second possible approach is to take an existing language for which we know it is sound and define our new language by elaboration into that language. That's a, an approach that's actually recently become more prominent in the so-called Hopper-Stone semantics of uh, standard ML, for example. Um, then we prove that we map well, this translation maps well-typed source terms to well-typed target terms, which is often a lot easier than showing soundness directly. And then with this now, soundness follows simply from the soundness of the target language. And one neat aspect of this is that the translation can be seen as a first step in compilation. It, it, it's not just a theoretical vehicle. It's actually useful uh, as a way of implementing a language. So for the purpose of this talk, at least, I will go the second route uh, in the paper we also uh, show an, uh, a direct semantics for the uh, for the source language. So what we do is we take an, ex an implicitly typed source language, and by type inference and translation we go to um, an explicitly typed target language. And a very very um, so the favorite language for this purpose in the at least in the functional community is. Um, some sort of variant of system F. So it's the polymorphic lambda calculus explicitly typed, and our version of it will have polymorphic extensible records. But it does not have sum types. It does not have case types, not to mention extensible ones. It does not have exceptions. 
But what we know for this language, because we did this already last year in the, in the previous year's ICFP paper, we have an efficient translation mechanism for that language using index passing. So we need to eliminate all the features that we don't have uh, in the course of translation. We need to eliminate sums and cases, and for that we do a dual transformation. I will say in a moment what that means. And we eliminate exceptions by making control explicit via CPS or continuation passing style uh, transformation. Dual transformation relies, as the name implies, on duality. Duality is, uh, of course, a very uh, common um, phenomenon in mathematics in general and in, certainly in logic and in programming languages and type systems. Um, so it's the things that are famously duals of each other are AND and OR or uh, universal and existential quantification. In, in, the general, um, in the general sense, we can say that uh, we have duals if uh, the introduction form of one of the primal correspond to the elimination form of the dual and vice versa. In particular, records and sums are duals of each other. So some construction corresponds to record elimination. Some construction is injection into a sum type using a label. Record elimination is projection from a label from a record, which is also using a single label. So you can sort of see the correspondence there. Um, and uh, for the purpose of this talk, at least, more importantly, um, record construction uh, is the same as sum elimination, and sum elimination is case. Record extension is one form of record construction, so it corresponds dually to extensible cases. To illustrate this a little bit, so here's, here are, uh, here's one cases expression, and here are two injections into a sum type, and I, I'm noting the result type here in red. The cases expression simply translates to a record of functions one for each clause. And the injection into the sum turns into a function which takes such a record as its argument, projects out one of the fields, and applies that to the payload. And likewise for the other. Now, uh, matching a sum, uh, cases to a sum just uh, corresponds to applying such a function to these um, to, to such a record. So we have that cases types here with a say label L1 with type tau1, L2 type tau2, um, result type being tau corresponds in the translation to a record type where L1 is a field of function type from tau1 to tau and L2 is a field of function type from tau2 to tau. And some types translate to this kind of function type, which takes such a the function takes such a record as its argument and produces a result. And the sum itself doesn't care what the result type is, so it is polymorphic in the result type. So that's where we need higher order polymorphism. Now the story is a little bit more complicated than the details are in the paper. I can tell you offline if you're interested. Uh, because, of course, these types can have type variables in them. That's the whole point in some sense. And then the translation, the direct translation like this, breaks down a little bit, so we need to throw in some additional type constructors into our uh, system F language to deal with those. Uh, the other ingredient was continuation passing style. So we have uh, expressions of, if you have an expression of type tau, that corresponds, or an expression describes a computation which will eventually send a result of type tau to its context, to its continuation. So in continuation passing style, this E turns into a computation C, which takes a tau continuation as its argument and sends its result to, that continu to this continuation. A tau continuation is simply a function from tau to answers. Now with... Uh, when we also have exception types, we do the same thing, except we also take into account the exception handler. An exception handler 
is simply a, a continuation that takes a sum type as its argument. The only problem with this is that now suddenly we have a sum type in our translation again, and we wanted to eliminate sum types, so we apply dual transformation to this, and the whole thing turns into something we call a row handler, and a row handler is just a, an abbreviation for a record of continuations. So what happened here is that we started with an exception handler. The exception handler by CPS transformation turns into a continuation function. So it's a function that takes a sum as its argument. And by dual transformation, that turns into a record of continuation functions. So via CPS and duality, we get we, we get to translate into a language that doesn't even have a native notion of exceptions. Uh, not to mention uh, any un uncaught ones. And therefore we can make this bold claim um, that well-typed programs do not have uncaught exceptions. That's sort of a trivial uh, result from this. If we get the translation right, if we can prove that the translation preserves uh, uh, typing, then we get this result essentially for free. And as I already said, this, the translation into this kind of system F, since we have it, an efficient translation mechanism from there to machine code already, uh, it's in some sense the first step uh, in a compiler. So, Can you say something about false alarms? I mean, it seems, especially in the higher order case, and the things your, your system would, would um, false alarms means false positives, where the uh, where the uh, so indeed. So the the exception analysis is since it's uh, sound, um, it can only err on the sort of false positive side, and it does. You can write programs that uh, where the type checker says no, that doesn't look right to me. There seems to be an uncaught exception. Um, usually these are fixable by the programmer by uh, introducing, uh, by being explicit about how you manage the exception context. So in our language, we actually have a construct called unhandle, which says that, uh, which, where you say e unhandle, um, say a, which means we run e without an exception handler for a. Because sometimes, it can happen that you that you have a a recursive function which calls itself, but there is an exception handler around this. In this case, we we have a problem. Uh, we can only type check this if we have polymorphic recursion in the language, because this function. Uh, this occurrence of the handler claims that f does not handle a, whereas obviously the the occurrence of the handler inside the body of f does uh, it claims that it it doesn't. So, uh, but we can fix this by putting in here a local unhandle a, just on that call, because th that handler is presumably here to handle some other stuff that is not the call of f. So this is sort of a common case you would find in practice. Uh, I think recursion. So, so, recursion. Um, so I'm, I'm building here a little bit on work by Lara and, and his student uh, Peso, who did an exception an analyzer based on a very similar type system. Um, and uh, they described this in some detail. Uh, and they actually used polymorphic recursion in their analysis uh, to handle such cases automatically. Whereas we don't want to use polymorphic recursion because we don't have general type inference for that. Uh, but we give the, the programmer the tools to fix the problem locally where it occurs. Well, I think the false positive would occur like in an, if you have an if then else uh, statement and only one branch raises an exception. And the type inference would always say that this whole expression raises those kind of exceptions even if you call it with, with false. Well, uh, Yes, but if you assume that the branch can actually go into that, uh, the if can actually go into the branch where the exception is raised, then the type checker is right in some sense. If you somehow knew 
that the branch never branches that way. Uh, but that would require solving the holding problem. So that uh, I think this is. Uh, but, but that's where the false positives come from, right? Uh, in some sense, yes. I think. But as I said, I think you can always fix them. And, um, so if, if I have a statement, it says, you know, if parameter x is true, then I raise an exception, else I, I return some value. Then it will all, it can't be fixed, right? Because every time I call the function uh, with a particular value true or false as the parameter, the type inference would never would always abstract that to just a boolean. That will always say it can raise this exception, even though statically I can see in the program it's not the case. Um. So you're thinking of the situation where, where, the, where this exception is just raised as a sort of sanity check? No, I say, you know. Because if it really can't happen, then why is it there? Why is no, it, it, it can happen, right? So yeah. it depends on the calling context. So if I, if I call f true, it will raise the exception. If I call f it false, it won't raise the exception. Uh, type inference, will never know. Yes, yes, that is true, yes. So, and I think that's yes. the only case, really, for false positives, maybe except for the... Right. So for you the would have to write a specialized version of your function for, for that situation. That's true, yes. Okay. You're right. So in a language like Java, you have two kinds of exceptions. I think they might even be called exceptions and errors, where um, some are expected to be handled, and you should have explicit handlers for them and the other ones are not expected to be handled, but you may. You would just uh, model that by, by typing your program differently. So instead of having that little square thing saying I'm not handling anything, I'm, um, I would be able to handle the errors, for example, allowing all the errors to bubble up to the, to the top of the so, program. Uh, um, this is actually, uh, you, can, you could always do this, right? You could write your program without any handlers in them, and you get, you get an error that's saying, oh, there are uncaught exceptions A, B, C in this program, and you just strap a huge handler around the whole thing that handles those. Um, and uh, so this, the, the type system doesn't guarantee that the exceptions are handled in any useful way, right? It only says they are handled. And um, so you could implement a policy that sort of your, your own uh, convention that certain exceptions you don't handle, you let them bubble up and you handle them at the top level. Or you could even have a compiler flag that that says, okay, these exceptions are fine. We we do tolerate these. So you can capture this by the by the uh, typing judgment for whole programs. You could have a certain kind of ex exceptions there which may appear in the exception type. So because you're converting it to like continuation passing style, if you will. Um, in, in a conventional CPS style, you would have, let's say if there are 20 error cases that, this, that you're willing to let bubble up, you would have, have to have 20 continuations at the top level saying, and you would have to pass, it, pass those continuations in everywhere, basically saying this way. In your world, I think, if I'm understanding things correctly, you could pass in a, an aggregate saying, okay, if any of those two, uh, any of these 20 things occur, just call this one continuation and it'll deal with it a little bit. So, Actually, the way I've phrased it so far in the talk, and uh, this is the way I leave it in the talk, <laughs> is uh, exception handlers really turn into this big packet of like, uh, a record full of individual continuations. In the actual compiler, we do it. We sort of do a second round of dual transformation back to the sort of more standard way, where the exception hand where the exception handler record at the end of the day is. Uh, represented by a single function that does dispatch. But we still do the same index passing transformation because it turns out that if you do it literally the way I'm describing, you get inefficiencies because um, you make the, the construct that deserves to be cheap, which is establishing a handler, expensive, and you make the, the exceptional case where an exception is raised cheap. And that's sort of the, the wrong trade-off. And uh, but you can fix this. Um, you still get the benefit from the index passing translation uh, because it integrates smoothly into this uh, sum typing and uh, case typing. Uh, so, for sort of pedagogical reasons, I left it at this point where exception handles are literally records of individual continuations, but you can think of a special representation of such a record as a function, 
um, which makes that a little bit cheaper in, in practice for the common case. So we have actually a compiler. This is not so in thin air. We have a compiler that compiles our little language to, in, at the moment, to PowerPC assembly code. And um, in, the, in the papers, we always show you this, uh, this path from ML poly R to the system F, and then the translation down to lower level calculi. Um, the actual compiler uh, doesn't really represent the program as a system F program at any point. It sort of step, stops halfway here and then goes directly to the lower level representation, which does index passing. So, but that's uh, in some sense just a, um, a difference in implementation strategy. But conceptually, the system F is there, and in a in a uh, in a formal account, it's easier to talk about this translation mechanism by introducing that in the media step. So a few words about the compiler. So we have this compiler. Um, it has all these features that I described. Uh, it's, a, it's a subset of core ML without data types. Um, it has extensible record, extensible cases. It does polymorphic projection on records, and it has polymorphic sum types. And notice that these are uh, duals of each other. Um, we also have this typed exception handling. Um, we, as of a few weeks ago, we now also have a prototype of an x86 backend, which is based on a on translation to C minus minus. I don't know how familiar people are here with C minus um, minus. The language has principal types, and the compiler exploits this by doing full type inference on it. No type annotations necessary, and in fact, no type annotations possible because our surface syntax doesn't even have notation for that at the moment. Um, the reason for this is not that I don't like type annotations, but the, the whole project started as the compiler for, uh, for a compiler course. And I wanted to, the language to be as small as possible. Um, I didn't want to bother with a, with a uh, type language. It could be easily added. And it's based on this index passing idea. So uh, related work, um, there's a lot of it. Uh, we were heavily inspired by Ohori's SML Sharp. And of course, we were relying on Remy's row polymorphism. Um, Chakarik implemented polymorphic variants in OCaml, but uh, the technical details are um, a little bit different. Uh, Dan here um, actually has worked on this problem as well. Um, Although I, I believe the technical details there are also slightly different, so we can talk about this uh, later. Um, there's some work, and there has been some, some work in the Haskell community to do the dual translate, the dual encoding of sums and cases directly in a language that is sufficiently rich to actually be able to express these. So this is all in Haskell, um, and. Uh, as far as exception analysis goes, there's also a huge body of work. A lot of it is based on um, on flow analysis to figure out when exceptions are um, always handled and when they might be not handled. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, Perso and Laura have actually implemented an exception analysis based on the same kind of typing, polymorphic typing and row type ideas. Their type system is more complicated than the one we describe because they want to be able to type check uh, programs in OCaml. And uh, so they don't have the benefit of unhandle and other constructs in the language. What we did here is we said, OK, we're language designers, and we don't want this complicated type system that they use. We want to use a simpler type system. And we trade the complexity of the type system for some other um, little possibly annoying things that we can't hide it. It's kind of the bubble under the carpet. You, you hit it here, and it pops out somewhere else. Uh, but um, I think we successfully simplified the type system to a point where the programmer could potentially use it on an everyday basis, uh, which I think is not possible for the uh, for the Pessoa type system. OK, so I'm uh, close. I'm done with the. Uh, with the part about um, row polymorphism, now I want to to know about a few other 
things I've done uh, over the past few years. Uh, one is work on self-adjusting computation. Self-adjusting computation, the idea there is uh, what's an old idea, and people know it under different names as well, such as incremental computation and so on. The idea is that we have a program that we run on input, we get some output, but now the input changes by some small delta. So we have input prime, and we want to adjust the output so that it reflects the change of the input. And we want to do this as quickly as possible. We want to take advantage of the earlier work we've done on very similar input. And my colleague uh, Umut Akar has spent his entire PhD on, uh, on this problem. And there are some language, program language um, technology issues involved there. And so I got into this as well. And uh, most recently, we had a paper at ESOP which describes for the first time a formal account of semantics of um, his approach which combines memorization and change propagation. And uh, in the, what we show there is that the formal semantics that we developed is actually consistent in the sense that what we want to say at the end of the day is that if we do this change propagation and adjustment from here to here, we get the same answer that we would have gotten if we had just rerun the program from scratch. But that's uh, the high-level theorem that we want to show. And um, uh, we have done so, and we have actually formalized the proof in 12, uh, which was uh, quite an exciting uh, adventure. Um, the second body of work also recently appeared at ESOP. This was with Derek Dreyer. And we worked on. Um, the completeness of type inference for ML. And that's uh, maybe somewhat surprising because everybody knows, of course, that type inference for ML is complete. And it's been proved many years ago. The problem is the theorem was proved for the language without the module system. And it was never reproved with the module system. And it was, in fact, not true with the module system. So we, Derek discovered the problem, and we figured out a way of fixing it. And uh, Last slide, uh, I've also worked on uh, the semantics on, of software contracts. Um, contract, uh, contracts for higher order functions was pioneered uh, by Findler and Phil Eisen. And um, so Robbie Findler gave an algorithm that says if there's a contract between two parts of a program, we run the program. And if I, one part of the program violates the contract, the algorithm will successfully point to that part uh, of the program and say, you are bad. But the problem is that they didn't give a, a semantics for contracts. So they didn't really, we couldn't state a theorem that says, whenever the algorithm says, you are bad, that part of the program really is bad. Because we didn't even define what it means to be bad. Um, and so in, in, uh, at, in ICFP04, we gave a paper that gave a set theoretic semantics of contracts um, which, we, using uh, that semantics, we were actually able to show that the algorithm is indeed correct. But the semantics showed some, some surprising little aspects of contract checking, which we then later, with Robbie Findlay, went back and we worked on sort of a different view of the problem. We, we tried to shine a light from a different angle and confirmed the findings that we um, uh, had in the ICFP paper. Okay, so this is it. Um, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take more questions, um, or you can grill me one on one. Uh, <laughs> um, you showed the rules for raise and handle mm -hmm. in the source language. Yes. Can those be typed as, as functions? Raise, a raise function and a handle function? Um, I guess you can type. Um, um, yes, you can pretend raise to be a, a function. Of course, it's a function that won't return. But yes, uh, raise could be a function. Handle could be a function if it takes a thunk as its argument. Because the, uh, there's a computation that, that is uh, protected by the handler.
Uh, so if you, an ordinary function would evaluate its argument before, before the handler function gets invoked. So you would have to pass in a suspended computation. But otherwise, yes, I think you can do that. But it, but it wouldn't work for your uncalled exception handling framework, right? Mm -hmm. Because there you make special assumptions about handle and race in your, in your type system uh, to add or subtract from the uh, row of possible raised exceptions. Um, right? So if I would just make it a, a primitive handle or race, you wouldn't be able to... Point. Uh, yeah, you might be right. So handle might actually not be, you might not be able to do this as a function because of that. Race is fine. Race is no problem. There's no, nothing oh, yeah. special going on. But for handle, you're right. Yes. Because, in fact, what I didn't show you, we have several different constructs for handling exceptions um, that have slightly different typing. And, um, yeah, so I don't think you can express this as a function abstraction at this point. Yeah. Sorry about that.